Well, thank you, Dean Lyons, so much for inviting me to come out today. Someone asked me if I live, uh, how much time I spend in Hungary. Well, I live in Hungary, and in fact, in two and a half years, I've only been home one other time. This is my second trip back. But uh, when I got the call to come out, I really felt that um, I, I had to come. I had to come because my two years at Berkeley at Haas School were two of the most formulative years of my life. And at a minimum, um, because I'm not sure how much I can impart to you, but at a minimum, I really felt that I had to come back and show my gratitude for the two years that I spent here because they were so incredibly important to me. So I came to Berkeley almost immediately after college. And I know that they don't do that so much anymore, but this was back in 1990 when we were in Barrows and there was no carpet. Um, so maybe the standards were a little bit lower, but, um, <laughs> but I, found myself, I found myself here and I had only studied liberal arts. Um, I came uh, for the first day of class and um, our finance professor gave us this background lecture on day one. And the first thing he talked about in the background lecture was uh, the time value of money. And uh, this was absolutely riveting to me. I had never heard anything like this. I, I go out of class, I go to the pay phone, and I call my sister and said, Athena, did you know that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow? So there were some of us who came in without a lot of background. Uh, so, um, uh, so I had a lot of catching up to do in those first few months. Um, I saw one of my friends here today who was a fellow member of my study group, which we fondly named Study Team Zero because of the score that we kept getting on our accounting quizzes. Uh, and uh, he left the group. I'll give him that credit, Mr. Zom. There you are. He left the group, and uh, I was alone with Ken Dupee. But, um, but seriously, it was, uh, it was really a challenge. And, I, and no question about it, I came to Haas to learn and to try to understand the world of business, because I'd only studied classical archaeology and English literature. And after I graduated from college, I realized that I had missed a big part of what I considered to be an important education, which was to understand the way that the world works in terms of business and economics and trade. Uh, so that's what I came for. And I can certainly say that with the help of many very generous uh, teammates and uh, some pretty terrific tutors and great professors, I really managed to get that technical, um, technical education that I was looking for. But there was a lot more that I got when I was here, um, and I'd like to uh, talk about that. So even before classes started, we had an orientation. And I can remember it really like it was uh, yesterday. Scott McNeely, who was a real hotshot at the time, I think he's retired from Sun Microsystems, but he was our... Uh, orientation speaker. And he gave this really interesting talk about corporate responsibility. And he basically walked through all the reasons why he believed that his corporation should not be engaged in philanthropy. And that, in fact, it was his job to maximize the investment of the shareholder and the value of the shares of the company, and then allow the shareholders to take that profit and exercise their values through philanthropy. And it was really interesting because first of all, I just thought it was so shocking that anyone would come up with an argument as to why not to be philanthropic, uh, even in the, in the corporate environment, because I just never heard anything like that. But, uh, but what I loved about this talk was that he clearly had wrestled through a problem. And he brought us along to explain to us essentially how he had solved it. And what I could see from this exercise that he brought us through was that this was going to be a place where we not only learned about business, but where we were going to learn about how our business interests and our values were going to compete throughout our careers. Uh, I don't know if 
anyone after 1992 had to explain a moral dilemma and then explain how you answered it as part of the application? Was that anybody else? Anybody remember that? Um, but clearly that sort of set the tone. And even though, again, we were really here to learn how to think out of the box, how to manage businesses, how to solve problems, there was always throughout it peppered through this reminder of values and how you, you think about problem solving, not just from an examination and understanding what your interests are, but also an examination and understanding of when your values complement or contradict those decisions that you make. Now, the reason that I put such an emphasis on this is because fast forward 20 years later, and if you were to ask me, what is your job as a US ambassador, I would tell you it is my job every day in any way I can to advance the interests and the values of the United States of America. So when I look back on the two years that I spent here, it was far more than just the technical uh, and uh, book learning. Uh, it really was about how to problem solve when you had those kinds of conflicts. Um, so I left here in 92, and for most of the next 18 years, uh, I worked in real estate. Um, definitely the, uh, what I, the business elements of what I learned here were really important because Haas has one of the finest um, departments for real estate in the United States, and, and that, was, uh, that was my focus while, while I was here. Um, I didn't use everything that I learned. I, I remember bringing home to Sacramento the concept of using regression analysis to determine cap rates. Uh, and again, I don't know if Professor Rosen is still teaching that class uh, in that way, but it wasn't so widely accepted among the brokerage community of Sacramento. Nevertheless, I, it, I felt like it was a good thing to bring to the table. Um, but I worked for 18 years in real estate and, and land development, and um, I went into a family business. My father immigrated from Greece after World War II and then the subsequent civil war there. And uh, he was a farm worker in California. He started in Lodi, uh, and it was really only because of the greatness of this country that he went to school and he had the kinds of opportunities that he had in his life. Uh, so he founded this development company, and I went and worked with him for, again, about 18 years. Um, for the last half of it, I was president of the, of the family business. And um, I'm happy to talk about real estate in Sacramento. And I'm going to leave a lot of time for Q&A, so please feel free to ask about it. But even though it was the primary work of our company to look after our business interests, we also engaged very much with government and we engaged very much with civil society. And I want to bring this to your attention because you may not hear it anywhere else, but Secretary Clinton talks about this all the time. Uh, she talks about the three legs of the stool that make up a democracy. You have the business sector, which, judging from the list that I saw most of you were in. You have the government sector, which I also noticed that many of you probably work with. And then you have civil society. And if you think about it, between government and business, you have serious competing interests. And civil society, this third leg of the stool, is pretty much everything else. Uh, it's everything from neighborhood groups to nationwide advocacy uh, organizations. So the reason I put it in that context is because right now I'm serving in a country that up until 22 years ago only had government, didn't have a free market, didn't have a free business sector, and uh, most certainly didn't have civil society. In fact, um, engaging in advocacy of any kind against the government would probably land you in jail. Um, and so it's really in retrospect that from that vantage point, I'm able to look back on the way that throughout my business career, as I went along, I was always understanding what the what the government's interest was in my business and what we were doing, because of course land development is highly regulated by the government. 
And I was all, also really engaged with civil society because also with this highly regulated business, what individuals and neighbors and organizations thought about what we were doing was really going to have an impact on what we were doing. But I bring this up to you because we're talking about path uh, bending leadership. And I really encourage you to think about your role in your businesses as one leg of the stool and consider what's going on and, in, and inform yourself of what's going on relative to the business, archi uh, the uh, government architecture where you're working, um, but also uh, to understand the way that civil society is impacting you. And I would add to that as well how incredibly important it is um, and maybe Scott McNeely would disagree with me on this, uh, but how incredibly important it is to stay engaged with civil society as a member of civil society in any way you can. Because I really think if you think of, of what you're doing holistically within the framework of the three legs of the stool, you'll see opportunities where you can impact and create change in ways that maybe you don't always consider if you're only looking at the bottom line. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, all right, everyone is, of course, the job. What is it like to be a United States ambassador? And maybe even more saliently, why would a land developer in Sacramento be asked to be a US ambassador? And uh, I, I asked myself the same question when I was sitting in the State Department um, with what we fondly call charm school. Uh, it's basically the orientation process that you go through down at Foggy Bottom to get ready for the job. Uh, I was with um, the first wave of President Obama's ambassadors and we um, all sort of came to the realization at the same time that this is a real job. That <laughs> We're not going to, um, even though these countries where most, most political appointees go are allied countries, so you can't wreck too much havoc, uh, there's, there's a very serious commitment that you make uh, when you go into this position. And believe it or not, and certainly with President Obama's administration, the vetting was really serious. He wanted to make sure that we could do the job. Well, the embassy that I run in Budapest has almost 400 people, and we do an enormous amount of work in this former Soviet satellite country. Uh, we do work on our bilateral relationship, and we do work together outside of both Hungary and the United States uh, in countries that are not uh, NATO allies. So, uh, so you ask your, yourself, you know, when you start getting into the, to the, uh, uh, the details of what's being expected of you, why the United States does this. And, you know, I gotta say, the United States is very creative with our own path-bending leadership. And the idea is, and this is a time-tested formula, that groupthink can set in to the Foreign Service. And by bringing one out of every four ambassadors and putting them at the top of the chain of command, you introduce into the thinking of that organization all sorts of, um, of, of innovative ideas and, uh, and ways of doing business. And we shake things up. And so at first you're thinking, wow, what, am, what in the world do I have to contribute that a career foreign service officer couldn't do so much better? And then after you're there for a while, you start to realize that the training that you have as a business person, it's different. And I would absolutely argue that the training I had both as a business person but also here at Haas uh, really has helped me enormously in being able to, um, to represent my country and engage on behalf of the United States in Hungary. I'm gonna just say one more thing. Um, and that is because I think sometimes it's easy to, when you're in the midst of, of your businesses to go through phases where maybe you're not reading about foreign affairs or keeping up on uh, international relations. There is a very important summit coming up. It's the NATO summit in the end of May that's going to take place in Chicago. And I really encourage everybody to um, 
to keep an eye on what happens in Chicago. NATO summits don't happen every year. They happen when they're needed, when there are issues the allies need to come together to discuss. And uh, in the United States, we have never had a NATO summit anywhere else than in Washington. So the fact that the president is having this in Chicago is a really big deal. There will be something like 50 world leaders who will be there. Uh, prime ministers or presidents of the, uh, of the countries that are going to be represented. Not all of them are NATO allies. There are also partners. Um, I believe that uh, every country that is par participating in Afghanistan is going to be there. So I really encourage you to watch what happens because this administration in its own way has been leading the way and trying to think differently and lead in a path-bending way. Uh, and you probably have all heard it described as smart power. But that's much more than just a catchphrase. There has been a new way of doing business that this administration has um, been uh, following now for the last three and a half years. And this is not a campaign speech. Um, but smart power is the elevation of diplomacy and development, which is basically foreign aid. Diplomacy and development up alongside defense. And if you keep an eye on the dialogue and the reports of what happens in Chicago, I think you're going to be able to see this at play. What you're also going to see is what I started with, and that is this constant need to balance interests and values of the United States uh, around the world. And I can tell you, uh, it has just been a tremendous, tremendous honor to be able to do that on behalf of our country, my country, our country for those of you who are US citizens in the room. And um, if you happen to be in Budapest, stop by and see me. <laughs> Should I take questions? Yeah? And we have a little time for questions, but I will ask you to use the microphones because we, we, of course, have it videoed and it's much better for us. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for uh, your speech. It's great to have you here today. Um, I'm actually uh, very interested in hearing what your position is and the position of the United States with regard to the political and economic situation currently in Hungary. Um, yeah. As some of you may know, there's uh, been quite a big uh, push by civil society to the right. And it's actually changed a lot of the constitution and the integration mm -hmm. and the proposals that the EU wants mm -hmm. uh, in terms of integration of a post-communist uh, society into you know, the greater EU framework. In that regard, I mean, how do you balance the national cultural sovereignty that a country wants after 50 years of you know, being ruled by a communist nation with the political economic integration that obviously the EU nation wants, or the EU uh, super governmental kind of organization wants, and how does the U.S. kind of deal with that as a third party observer? Well, thank you for the question. You are unusually well informed about events in Hungary. <laughs> Uh, and it's true. Um, Hungary is a, an EU member state. It is a NATO ally. It is very unusual that the United States would ever comment on the internal political affairs of a country fitting that profile. But we have. And we have essentially for an unusual political dynamic that's occurred whereby through a free and fair election, a two-thirds supermajority was swept into government. Uh, and it is a center-right government, and essentially, it's two-thirds of the seats of parliament are like this, and the remaining one-third are held equally between the right and the left. So you have the far-right party, essentially a neo-fascist party that declares itself not a democratic party. So it has been a, 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 real, a real shift, and um, we have expressed some concerns that the vast reforms that you mentioned uh, could ha have a negative impact on the independent democratic institutions that are so important, like free media, like free judiciary, like independent central bank, like religion. 
And so we have been uh, engaging. It's unusual. Uh, I certainly didn't bargain for it when I signed up. I suspect that I wouldn't have been sent there if anybody had bargained for it. Um, but it has been, um, you know, a real challenge. You know, we have a tremendous State Department staff there, and we work very closely with Washington um, to work through our engagement. And uh, what we try to do on every level is hold in our minds at the same moment these two equally important uh, notions. One is that this is a democracy and all of the things you know, that I described, free and fair elections. And on the other hand, that we have these concerns. And how we work together and engage with them as friends has really been a delicate, um, a delicate process. But um, you know, it's very important if we lose sight of those values um, because of our interests, um, then we're no longer the United States. So that's been our, our, uh, our engagement strategy. Well, Walter? Lenny, we were talking earlier, um, and your term is officially up later this year. So if President Obama wins, what's next for you? Oh, thank you. I, I actually, was, if anyone's got a job, I'll be out of a job. No matter what, we serve for three years. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I'll tell you, I was 43 years old when I was sworn in, which makes me one of the youngest women ever to serve as a U.S. ambassador. And um, I wanted, I don't know if it was just Professor Rosen thinking that maybe I couldn't be a land developer uh, back in the day, but I really wanted to understand and be able to um, manage the business that my father built and also build it and take it to another level, which notwithstanding the current economic situation of real estate in the Central Valley, um, I still feel pretty good about, about my record there. Uh, I also wanted to have a family, and I got married about 12 years ago. I have two little boys, and we're all together in Budapest. And then the last thing I wanted was to be a U.S. ambassador, so I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. But I'll tell you what, no matter what it is, I will never forget the lesson that I've learned on so many levels about the interests and the values of the United States. And whether I'm in the private sector or whether I stay in government in some level or whether I work in nonprofit, that will always be my guiding light. Thank you. We all know that the European Union, uh, it's not doing very well lately in terms of economy. As someone who lives in Europe, and also it's a little bit outside from the Europe, so you have a view from an outsider. Where do you think Europe is going from an economy perspective as well as as a union? Is it going to be broken up? Are there countries who are gonna leave it, uh, basically just break down? What was your perspective? So I just sat through the presentation by Professor um, Rose. Rose, is that his name? That's right. He was not so optimistic about the future of the Eurozone. <laughs> uh, and many people that. share that perspective. The United States perspective, and Secretary Geithner has been over to Europe many, many times uh, over the course of the last you know, year or so, uh, engaging with the Europeans. And we think that Europe within itself has the ability to get through and keep the economic union intact. We believe that they have the ability to do it. The only thing really that stands in their way are the politics of it, and there's no question that it's challenging. But if the ultimate goal is the economic well-being of all of the member states, the stakes are very high. And so I know this has been used as logic quite often, but at the end of the day, if you have a whole bunch of countries who all, which all want the same thing, and within is the wherewithal to be able to preserve that economic union, we think that uh, they can do it, and they certainly have all of the support of the United States. Uh, and also, of course, and this I do agree with um, Professor Rose, is that the stakes are very high for us. We um, very, very much want to see them get through it. But watch the elections in France and watch the elect elections in Greece. I was just in Greece two weeks ago. I'm Greek American. I was just in Greece two weeks ago. And uh, the politics of Europe are just extraordinary. 
many, many countries, the, the governments have, have uh, come down as a re result of the um, economic debates of those countries. And in Greece right now, the two leading uh, political parties, um, PASOK and New Democracy, together may not get 50% and be able to have a coalition because of so many of the splinter factions on the right and on the left. Time for one more question, if anybody would like to. Uh, Madam Ambassador, thank you for coming. Um, I just have a quick question regards um, national competitiveness. As you know, we're here in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, the ecosystem, the culture. Many countries are envious and they want to replicate that in their own countries. And I know countries like Hungary and Bulgaria, they've been, they've been thinking about building uh, tech parks. One of the professors here, Professor Isaacs, he's one of the esteemed Silicon Valley experts, he basically said this ecosystem can't be replicated anywhere else in the world. So in terms of Hungary and some of the surrounding areas in Eastern Europe, what do you th see as some of the challenges and opportunities? And are the governments there serious about you know, building up their competitiveness through science and technology? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Look, Silicon Valley is the envy of the world. Uh, what goes on in Northern California is extraordinary. It is absolutely extraordinary. And as far as anyone can tell, it's going to continue to multiply, which is um, extremely important, not just for this region or this state, but for our country. Uh, many countries like Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Poland, of course they all want to build a, an Intel uh, element of their economies. But the reality is, is that most of them are export economies and most of them rely on foreign direct investment to come in to do in large part manufacturing uh, because wages are comparatively low for certainly for the, the location relative to the rest of Europe. Uh, and they're highly skilled and educated workforces. So that's where they are. But how many times I get the question how can we create in our country what you have created in the United States? You know, um, and maybe I can just leave with this. Nothing makes you more of a believer in American exceptionalism than living outside of the United States. <laughs> mm. Are you a US citizen? Are you a U.S. citizen? Are you a U.S. citizen, Victor? Are you? Yeah. See, Victor here, very impressive guy, a U.S. citizen. It hasn't changed. Uh, we still are the most influential uh, country in the world. I think Hillary Clinton put it this way. She said, um, "The United States is." Uh, it cannot lead alone, but the great problems of the 21st century cannot be solved without us. So uh, I, I think this our sort of um, crisis that we've had and the discussion um, that uh, has been going on in this country is important. It's part of what keeps us sharp and keeps us on our toes. Do we have problems? No question about it, we have problems. But does that mean that we are not situated in such a way that we can continue to move forward and advance, make the kinds of advancements that will allow us to continue to, to lead? I, I happen to believe that it's the case. Um, if you're feeling like you want a shot of that, just, just go outside of the United States, but not to necessarily a big city that's doing well. Go into the countrysides, talk to people. Um, we have uh, so much here that allows us, and I believe will allow us, to continue to, uh, to lead. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you.